Thanks, Emmanuel. It's good to be back here at IHES. Um, yeah, so I was uh, slated to give three lectures on brown and capsaicin primes. I forgot when, when I agreed to do this, but um, I think it was before Maynard's work, actually. But uh, Well, you had agreed to give a course on something, but you had not given the topic. I see, right. Um, so events have kind of moved faster than, than anticipated. So um, the, the, uh, the theorem about bionic aspirin primes is now so easy that I can present it in one hour. Um, and so, but but uh, the other two lectures will be on, on equidistribution estimates on primes, uh, which is still relevant for this. But um, OK, so uh, let's talk about bionic aspirin primes. Um, so the, the uh, OK, so let Pn denote the nth prime. And then for any natural number m, uh, define hm to be the limb inf of the gap between the nth prime and the n plus first, first n plus mth prime. So uh, hm is the smallest interval for which you can, you can squeeze in um, uh, n plus 1 primes inside such an interval infinitely often. Okay, and so uh, what we care about is is what uh, what are the values of these numbers. So, for example, the, the twin prime conjecture is just the assertion that H one, the, the gap between consecutive primes, is is equal to two uh, infinitely often. Um, more generally, the uh, the prime the hardy little prime pupils conjecture. Which generalizes the, the, the twin prime conjecture um, uh, would imply as a special case that uh, the higher m's, the higher h's, should um, be equal to h of m plus one, where h of k is defined to be the um, di the, the smallest diameter, minimal diameter. of an admissible key tuple H1 up to HK. OK, so an admissible um, uh, K tuple is, is, uh, is a K tuple of integers, uh, let's say in increasing order, uh, such, that, um, uh, such that you miss one congruence class <coughs> mod P for every P, okay, which avoids so i.e. Uh, a tuple of, uh, of increasing integers uh, which avoids at least one congruence class. On p for all primes p. OK? So for example, uh, 0, 1 is not admissible because it, it doesn't avoid any congruence classes mod 2. But 0, 2 is admissible as the first uh, admissible 2 tuple. And this is why h1 should be equal to 2. Um, and similarly, the, the narrowest uh, 3 tuple you can get is a 0, 2, 6 or 0, 4, 6 would also work. A 0, 2, 4 doesn't work because it doesn't avoid um, anything about 3. So what should happen? So, so h1 should equal uh, 2, h2 should equal 6. Uh, H3 uh, should equal, I think, tw uh, I should know this, but uh, 8. OK. Um, and then uh, 12, 16, and so forth. OK. Um, so th these are what the HMs should be. Um, these numbers are well understood, by the way. So um, asymptotically, um, yeah, for large K, the, um, uh, the the narrowest k tuple that you can you can have uh, is at most k log k and at least half k log k up to up to smaller errors. Um, so these are easy. These are both fairly easy. Um, uh, for this bound, you just observe that that the first k primes, the first k primes larger than k, are admissible. Okay, you just think about it for a minute, and you see that's true. Uh, and the prime number theorem tells you that the diameter of this set is about k log k. So that gives you the upper bound. Um, the lower bound is a consequence of the brun tisch inequality. Uh, 
um, you know, if you remove <laughs> one congruence class from a block of intervals mod p for every p, Brun-Dichmarsh tells you an upper bound for how many, uh, how many guys are left. And if you, if you, if you just plug that in, you, you'll get this lower bound. Um, and these are basically the, um, these are almost the best known bounds. Uh, they, you, you can improve upon the little of ones on both sides by using slightly sharper constructions or slight refinements of the Brun-Tischmarsh inequality, for example, the Montgomery Vaughan large civil inequality. Um, but uh, but this, this, this is, this is uh, where we're at. Also for small k, like k up to 160 something, uh, you, uh, we have, um, you can use uh, uh, computers and, and compute exactly what these ages, these ages are. Okay. And then uh, for medium-sized k, like a million or something, we, we, there's lots of, of, of uh, numerical upper and lower bounds we can get. Okay, so, so that's well understood, but uh, this, this conjecture is not well understood. Okay, so, um, um, all right. Um, so it's, it's not, even, not even obvious that these ages are finite. Um, of course, we have the prime number theorem. you the, the nth prime is roughly n log n, uh, but that doesn't tell you that these guys are finite. Uh, all that tells you is that um, these gaps, if you normalize the gaps by, by, by log of, say, pn, um, then, um, uh, then this, is just, this, uh, this becomes at most k, uh, at most m, sorry. Okay, uh, for just from the original principle. But uh, so uh, infinitely often, this should be of the order of log pn, but uh, you can't get much better than that uh, without actually doing more than, uh, using more than the pan-number theorem. Uh, conjecturally, sh uh, we should have much more to say about these ratios. These things should be Poisson distributed and so forth. Um, well, the, the, uh, the, uh, that's not quite right. Um, well, the, um, this distribution should be something connected to the, to the Poisson process. Uh, but uh, but th those conjectures are kind of out of reach. Uh, OK. All right. Hopefully, hopefully I don't need that board again. Okay. Um, all right. Um, okay. So, um, uh, so the, the big breakthrough in this area, the first big breakthrough was, uh, uh, gee, ninety, no, two thousand and two. Okay. Um, I forget now the exact date. I should have written that down. But. Um, I got some printed Yodorum, and I've forgotten the precise year, uh, the early 2000s. Um, so uh, they introduced a method to, uh, to control these things that uh, to basically what, what, they, uh, what they found was that if you, if you have a good equidistribution estimate on primes, then you can insert it into the machinery of the Solberg sieve Okay, and you can get control at least on H1. Uh, although initially uh, in their method, you couldn't say much about, about higher um, H1s. Okay, so what do I mean about equidistribution, equidistribution estimates on the primes? Uh, so let's need to introduce the von, von Mangold function. Okay, so the von Mangold function is log P when, P, when n is the power of P and zero otherwise. Essentially, um, it's the indicator function on the primes normalized um, and, uh, to have uh, some nice uh, multiplicative properties. Uh, for example, um, I mean, the, you know, this particular choice of function has this nice property that, that, uh, that uh, um, lambda convolve one is, is, is log. That's, that's, that's why we care about this function, really. Um, okay, so this, this is the von Mangold function. Uh, we have the prime number theorem, of course. Okay, so this is roughly x, um, and we have, we have the prime number theorem in mathematical progress progressions. Okay, that if you restrict to a, a primitive um, arithmetic progression, um, then at, at least for um, for fixed um, q and for, and for large um, uh, x, uh, this should be one over phi of q. Okay, that they sh uh, the prime numbers should be equidistributed in all the uh, congruence classes that are primitive. Okay, so um, so this is true for fixed Q uh, and large X. That's the prime number theorem in arithmetic progressions. And you can ask what happens um, if Q is not fixed, if you make Q a bit bigger. Um, so, for example, um, uh, yeah, okay, so... Um, 
And for sieve theory, um, you, you don't care about uh, a single Q so much, but you care about what happens to Q on the average. Um, on the other hand, you, don't, um, you, you do want uh, the estimate to be uniform in, in, the, in the modulus. So uh, let me just write down the uh, definition. So uh, given any theta, which means zero and one, uh, we say that we have the Elliott Halberstam conjecture at a level of theta um, if the following estimate holds that uh, if you take the discrepancy um, in the prime number, the error in the prime number theorem in arithmetic progress progressions, um, and then you take the worst discrepancy over all the Uh, primitive classes um, for each Q. Uh, so you take the worst guy for each Q, which is which uh, is uh, it makes things difficult. But then you get to averaging in Q, which makes it better again. Okay, if you average all Q up to a certain level, uh, and the way this is normalized, actually, average, uh, averaging actually is just summation. Um, the the, some other, the restriction to to Q here already is, is doing averaging for you. Um, then what you want is that you want uh, th this guy to be bounded by um, by X to with a power saving of any log you wish. For any fixed power of log, you, um, yeah, this should be much less than x. So uh, the, the trivial bound here, by the way, is x log x. Okay, this is trivial, uh, and so you want to save a, an arbitrary power of logarithm over, over the trivial bound. So um, the statement is saying basically that for most Q, uh, for um, um, like 99% of all Qs, uh, you have a, a good um, power number theorem in ethnic progressions. For, uh, for all primitive classes A mod Q, for, and then for most Q. Okay, so this is the Elliott Halberstam conjecture. Um, so the prime number theorem in ethnic progressions is, is kind of, in some sense, the, the theta equals zero endpoint of this. Actually, um, the Siegel Wolfert's theorem is maybe the more accurate. Yeah, so the. Um, so this is the definition, right? So, okay, so this is yeah, this is the, the definition. Yeah, no, okay. no, I'm not claiming this is a theorem. Um, okay. Depends on theta. Uh, yes, yes. Okay, so I, I'm going to say now what's known. Um, right. So um, right. So a quant uh, there's a quantitative version of the um, prime number theorem in, in ethnic progressions called the siegel wolfert theorem, uh, which uh, it doesn't quite correspond to. It's, it's sort of theta is, is zero in some sense. Uh, it, it, it says that if I call it star, that you know star is true uh, as long as Q is polylogarithmic. If you only restrict to, to Qs of, of, of uh, polynomial size, uh, then this is true. This is the siegel wolfert theorem. Uh, in that case, in fact, even, well, it's equivalent, but you, you, you get that for each Q separately. Um, and then bombier vinogradov the bombier vinogradov theorem, says that uh, you can, in fact, take Q all, all the way up to X to the minus, uh, X, the square root of, of, of X over time, um, up to a logarithmic loss. Uh, and, the, and the B that you lose here depends on, on, on this A. It might even be like A plus one half or something. I forget exactly what it is. Um, but you can almost get up to one half. So in, in particular, you get a halber stand for, for, for any theta just up to, just a little bit shy of one half. OK. Um, and then uh, this is still pretty much the best that is known for, uh, for this, uh, um, uh, um, for a halber stand as written here. So the conjecture. Is that this is true for all theta up to one? Uh, at one, it, it fails, um, and uh, um, it, it, you can't take Q up to x. In fact, you can't take Q even within a logarithm of x, or, or within um, like e to the square root log log x or something of um, of x as a result of um, um, Friedlander, Granville, Hilbert, and Meyer. Um, okay, but. Uh, Okay, but we can't get anywhere close to one. Okay, we, we're still stuck at one half. Uh, 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 with, with this exact, uh, for this exact estimate, later we'll see that there are weaker versions of this for which we can go, go beyond one half. Okay, so um, this is this is the the, the standard way to to uh, uh, to describe equidistribution estimates on primes. Uh, I should remark, by the way, that um, if you knew the generalized Riemann hypothesis (GRH), um, that would give you um, um, the Elliott Haberstam conjecture up to, up to one half, uh, and then you wouldn't need to average. That, that you'll get a good estimate for every Q, um, not just you know, on, on the average. Um, but even with GRH, um, even with GRH, we still can't push past one half. In fact, I'm not sure we can even push past. You can even do it anything like this B. Um, 
but Thomas conjecture, which is even stronger. Uh, right. It's not an error term. Um, yeah, you get a better error term uh, if you have these conjectures, but uh, uh, I, still, I still don't think you can, you can beat the one half even with. But, but this is conjecture. Anyway, this is very conjecture. Right. Okay. Yeah. So it's um, yeah, but it, it, it's sort of different universes. I mean, this SIF theorists care about um, ab about uh, um, about average case Q. Okay. And and multiplicative number theorists would uh, somehow the focus is more on individual values of Q. Um, and so it's, 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 it's somewhat orthogonal, but yeah. But Bombay Werner Goddard is sometimes called uh, GOH for SIF theorists. I mean, it, it, it's sort of as good as GOH, and it's unconditional. Well, it, it's, it's true. Um, okay. Um, it's not the main focus of my of my talk, but uh, um, of course, there's, there's, there's a, like with many things in analytic number theory, there, there is this issue. Uh, this this constant depends on a, and and and, uh, and on theta, of course. Okay, and uh, unfortunately, uh, because of the siegel wolfowitz theorem. Uh, depends on Siegel's theorem, uh, and Siegel's theorem is ineffective in the, in, 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 in the constants. We don't understand L1 chi as well as, as, well as we ought to. Um, all the constants here are ineffective, which is a little bit annoying. Um, in practice, it's not a big issue. Um, what is A? What is on the left-hand side there is no A? What is A? Uh, a is an arbitrary. Yeah, so, so for, for, for any fixed A. Um, no, do, uh, where is uh, there is no A in the formula? Oh, I, uh, I, I, a is there. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So um, yeah. So I'm, I'm, there's, there's an issue of what this constant is, how it depends on a, and this unfortunately is ineffective. There was no ex there was no explicit bound known uh, for this constant. Um, although in, in practice, if you want effective versions of of of, of the theorems that I'm going to say, it's it's not such a big issue because um, the failure can be localized to basically a single exceptional modulus. So you can find that there's a single Q for which something goes bad. Uh, or, or maybe um, a single set of primes for which things go bad. But for most Q, uh, outside, of, outside of a few exceptional ones, things are still good. Um, so it's, it's, it's not a big issue, but I, I'm not going to focus on effectivity issues today. OK, so these, these are the, um, uh, this is how you can measure <coughs> distribution on the primes. And so uh, what, uh, what Goldson, Pitts, and Yudum showed in their first paper back in early 2000s, uh, so first of all, uh, if you assume everything, if, if, you, if you assume um, if it happens down for all theta, uh, then you can bound H1 with quite a good bound, bound by 16, that you can find infinitely many pairs of primes distance 16 apart. In fact, they, only, they, um, it's, they don't need all theta. It's just theta sufficiently close to 1, like 0.996 or something. Um, that, uh, that, that's enough. Um, more generally, if you can get anything beyond 1 half, Okay. Like if you can get um, any improvement one half, and, and nowadays we normalize it one half plus, plus two um, um, pi here, um, then uh, you, you get some finite bound on H one. Um, but then, um, uh, but these are these are not known. Um, so just using Bombio Bombio Vinogradov, uh, they couldn't get finiteness. But what they were able to show, um, say, so if you normalize proof of a log. You at least get zero, so that, that, that you, you can find somewhat small prime gaps, which are a little bit smaller than the average spacing of log p n, but you can't get it as, as uh, up to, uh, close to bounded. Uh, later on, they were able to release this log of square root of log, and then in an unpublished work, um, um, uh, um, cube root of log. Uh, uh, it wasn't quite these three authors, but it's a different set. Um, okay, but these are all. I was asked about H one. Uh, the method initially could not handle even H two. Um, the, but the best they could do for H2 is that if you assume everything, if you, if you assume the Everett Hapstein conjecture, they could also get um, a small result. Uh, they could get it, they, they could extend uh, the, the result for, for the first gap to, to the second gap. But um, yeah, but uh, uh, for reasons which uh, uh, yeah, uh, got removed later, uh, they, were, they were not able to get beyond, uh, beyond one. Okay. So that was where things were 10 years ago. <clears throat> um, later on, it was observed uh, independently by Motohashi and Pince. And independently by Zhang, although this was several years later, um, that um, this conjecture is a bit too strong for what's needed. Um, for, to, to, get, to get, if you're just interested in, in bounding H1, for, for instance, um, um, you don't need the full strength of eight Haber stamp that you can, you can weaken uh, 
the other half percent conjecture beyond one half and, and still get um, boundedness um, of bounded gas friction primes. What is one half? What is after the problem? Sorry? You see, what you wrote, one half? Of plus two uh, var p. Okay, the, um, this is Zhang's notation. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a. It's a um, yeah. Um, okay. You could call it epsilon if you like. Okay. Um, all right. Yeah, I'm just used to calling it VAPI. All right. Um, well, okay. Um, yeah, if you can get anything beyond one half, uh, you can get bounded gas friction primes um, uh, um, on the Elliott Haberstam conjecture. But actually, you don't need the full Elliott Haberstam conjecture. Um, so, first of all, um, um, you can weaken it by taking the soup outside the sum. Um, uh, but um, okay, um, if if you um, but yeah, you have to co-prime to everybody to all a to to all primes up to some some threshold. So uh, okay, so it's the same conjecture. So you can weaken it in two ways. So, so here, um, you can choose a different A for each Q. So for each Q, you pick, you pick the worst um, you, you pick the worst A. Um, but rather than do that, you can just pick a single modulus A, which, but now you can think of it as an integer. Um, and then you, you caution it down to each, each of these, 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 these moduli. Now, um, this by itself doesn't actually um, gain you very much um, if you, if, uh, because of the Chinese remainder theorem, okay, that, that if all the Qs were co-prime, Already, then um, picking a single A for each Q is the same as picking a single modulus uh, jointly. Uh, but what you also do is that you restrict Q to, uh, you, you, to, to not 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 uh, to have to to not be co-prime. Uh, you 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 force Q to be so. This is now one half plus two bar pi. But you also force Q to be what's called um, x delta delta smooth. I guess in some in France I should call it fiable. Okay, All right, fine. Um, Okay, which means that um, it has, um, you know, so what this means, it has, has no, no prime factors larger than, larger than x to the delta. Um, so now, now there's two parameters, um, var p and delta. Uh, and and um, th this estimate becomes easier when delta is small because you have fewer, uh, you, you have, you have uh, um, fewer numbers and, and then q becomes more and more smooth, more, more variable. Um, Okay, so you restrict to, to, to smooth moduli so that, um, um, so that uh, then taking the soup out actually has some content because they have a lot of, of shared factors, um, 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 these cues. And, and so it, uh, um, the constraining the moduli to be all common, uh, you can actually get some mileage out of that. Okay, so this, this, is, this is a weaker statement. Uh, nowadays, we, we call it um, the motohashi pins zhang conjecture uh, with two parameters, uh, var p and, and delta. It's weaker than, than this conjecture, um, the Elliott Habersam conjecture. And uh, so the, the, the claim is that if you can prove this conjecture for some uh, value, value parameters bigger than zero, then you still get bound on this on, uh, of H1. Okay, so th this implication isn't quite implicit, is, is sort of implicit in, in this work, but uh, it is pretty close to, to being in, in these papers. Okay, and then of course uh, last year Zhang, what he did in this language was that he actually proved this conjecture for, for some for some uh, values of of, of p and delta, that he actually proved that this thing is is true for a specific choice of p and delta. And okay, it's not so important what value he got, but he he got some small positive value, one over one thousand one hundred and sixty-eight, um, and then with that he was able to get an explicit finite value of h one. Okay, and it was 70 million. Okay, um, and then so later on, um, uh, I and many others, including many people in the front row here, um, uh, formed what we call the Polymath 8 project, the eighth of these collaborative online math projects started by Tim Gowers about uh, I don't know, 10 years ago now. Um, and we were able to, to uh, improve um, uh, this result. So, so well, first of all, we we're able to get uh, a better distribution result for um, VAR p as big as as, uh, as anything up to up to six over seven hundred, 
uh, minus uh, minus the small thing. Um, the this, this small thing is uh, 9 over 35 delta. Okay. So you can get as, as close to 6 over 700 as you want by, by shrinking delta um, as, um, to be sufficiently small. Um, so this is a, a bound which is about 10 times better than, uh, than this bound. Uh, still about, about 20 times off from the truth, which is one quarter. But, um, okay, and so using that, we were able to get a uh, somewhat better bound. 4,680. Um, but it was still basically using the, the, the goldstein pinsey order method. Um, but then more recently, this, uh, I guess in October of last year, um, uh, it was realized by, uh, by James Maynard, um, also independently by myself, at least some of what he did, um, that um, actually um, you can, rather than improve on the, just on the distribution side of the argument of Goldstein Pinsey and Yodram, you can improve on the Silberg Sieve side of the argument. Um, and in fact, you don't need um, any distribution estimate at all. So in fact, uh, other than bombier vinogradov So um, just from uh, the classical bombier vinogradov estimate, uh, avoiding uh, the, these more difficult distribution estimates, he was able to actually show that the atron was bounded, in fact, even a better bound than what we had before. So he um, um, got a bound of 600 initially. Um, and this, the same methods show that if you had the full elliot Halberstam conjecture, uh, you can even get uh, or well, he was able to shave the uh, 16 uh, from, of course, the a little bit to, to 12. Uh, but perhaps more interestingly, um, for the first time, um, his argument was able to also control the higher gaps. So um, uh, unconditionally, he could get a bound, which is basically uh, exponential in M, equal to 4M. And on Elliot Halberstam, he could uh, get uh, something about half the size, but still, still exponential in M. Okay, but for the first time, we could now get bounded intervals with many primes in them. Um, and then um, after that, we actually joined forces. So he, he joined the polymath group. Um, and as of about uh, a month ago or so, we finished up. Uh, uh, what, we, what we can do now is, is unconditionally, uh, we can get, uh, well, actually, you say unconditionally. Oh, no, OK. Yeah, so uh, just using Bromio Vinogradov, we can, we can get uh, 246. Um, using our previous bounds, okay, so using, okay, we can improve uh, this slightly, okay, well, you, can, you can get a, 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 a modest gain, it's not, you can improve the exponent. Unfortunately, we have no way to improve the, uh, the, uh, um, the exponential loss. I mean, it, it should be like m log m, as I said above there, but uh, we, can, we can only get exponential here, uh, and unconditionally, uh, so if you assume, um, actually, not just the elliot habersam conjecture, but something which we call the, the generalized elliot habersam conjecture, um, then, in fact, uh, we, can get, um, we can get a gap of six. Um, and, we know, um, and also, this is our sort of best possible. Well, not in the sense that H1 actually is six, because we all believe it's two. Um, but it's, it's the best that, we, that, we, we, that one can ever hope to accomplish from purely sift theoretic methods, and, and all these methods are ultimately sift theoretic. I'll try to explain why. So, so there's this, there's this uh, parity problem of Silberg, which was, which, uh, was already known to block any sift theoretic attempt to, to prove the, the twin prime conjecture. But um, a variant of, of the method shows that you, you even can't get, for example, you, you can't prove h1 equals 4. Uh, you can't bound h1 by 4 um, from sift theory. You have to do at least 6. Okay, uh, the generalized Elliott Halberstam conjecture is the same conjecture as Elliott Halberstam, but you, you, ge you generalize it by replacing um, the von Mangold function by more general uh, convolutions, Dirichlet convolutions. Of arithmetic sequences, which will base certain um, bounds and estimates, which I, I think I, I won't write down. But it's, it's, it, you just replace uh, a von Mangold slightly more general class of of, 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 of functions. So then, then the results would uh, extend is it? Ah, good question. Okay, so the uh, the uh, bombay Vernogradov extends to that setting. That's the result of Motohashi. Um, Zhang's results, unfortunately, they do not extend to um, to um, 
functions of this generality. Um, at, at some point, what you, what, what's needed in Zhang's argument, I'll talk about this in, in the later lectures, is that you can decompose the Bonangle function in many different ways, some of which look like com Dirichlet convolutions of two functions, but also some of which look like Dirichlet convolutions of three or more functions. And it's, it's important that you have this, this flexibility to, to, um, uh, actually, um, to decompose actually different components of Bonangle into, into these pieces. Um, and uh, that, is, that structure is still used uh, in all the, the Zhang type arguments. We, we do need that extra structure. So unfortunately, we, uh, we have no um, Zhang type result for in this generality beyond one half yet. But in, in principle, there could be. Uh, I think it, it is, it's, that's, that's, that's more of a, just a, a limitation of our current technology. OK. Um, all right. But in principle, at least, uh, if you have enough equidistribution, then you can get the optimal SIF theoretic result, which, which, is, which is six. All right, so, so that, that's the state of, uh, of knowledge, uh, of results. OK, so let's talk about um, proof methods. Ah, OK, I see. It's, 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 it's invertible. OK, all right. So what we actually do is, I mean, the way we, we establish gaps, um, results about bounded gaps is, is actually by making progress on the prime tuples conjecture. So um, we, introduce what uh, notation of pins. Uh, we're going to introduce what's called the, the dixon heidi little conjecture, uh, DHL, with two parameters, k and g, k and j. Okay, so given two uh, so given two natural numbers j and k, k bigger than j, um, we denote by this the statement d h l Dixon Hardy Littlewood of k and j to be the assertion that for all admissible k tuples, okay, so so given um, any k tuple, um, then uh, there exists infinitely many n. such that if you look at the shift of this k-tuple by n, that this k-tuple contains lots of primes, contains j primes, at least j primes. Okay, so given any admissible k-tuple, if you shift it far enough, you can eventually catch at least j primes. Okay, so the, 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 the prime tuples conjecture of Hardy and Littlewood says that you should, in fact, be able to make all these guys prime, that, that you should be able to get, uh, um, to get k primes in a k tuple. Now, that would be wonderful if we can prove that, but that, 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 that's, that's way out of reach. So, so, so even, getting two, even getting two primes in a two tuple, that would give us a true prime conjecture. Okay, so, so this, this we can't prove. Okay? But what we can prove is that we can prove weaker versions of this um, where, where k is bigger than j. Um, so, for example, um, okay. so the, the final results that we know, for example, is, is unconditionally, um, I can tell you um, that, uh, um, uh, that the, 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 the dixon hardy little conjecture is true for 50 and 2. So given any admissible 50 tuple, I can find for you um, a shift of it, which contains at least two primes. Um, and it turns out that you can write down a, a, a missile 50 tuple of diameter 246. Um, and th this implies, so this is why H1 is less than 246. Okay. Um, and on the generalized Elliott Halberstam conjecture, we can actually um, get 3, 2, which is about as close as you can get to 2, 2 without actually uh, getting 2, 2. Um, so um, given any admissible 3 tuple, um, for example, uh, 0, 2, and 6, um, then, and, then you can, we can find shifts of, the, of this triple where two of these guys are prime. Okay? And so this, this is what gives you h1 is prime by 6. Okay. Um, 
at this point, I may just pause to make an, an, an amusing note. So um, this, um, this uh, uh, argument, um, so I, 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 uh, here we're, we're taking very simple linear forms. It's just n plus a constant, n plus a constant, n plus a constant. But the same argument, you can, you can take other affine linear forms. You can stick a 2 here, or you can, you can maybe do, uh, do h minus n, whatever. You can, you can take other linear forms, and um, a similar argument um, uh, holds. So um, one I'm using. So rather than to play with n, n plus two, n plus, n plus six, um, there's a there's a connection with the Goldbach conjecture. Um, so actually, um, the same argument shows that on GH, uh, if if n is a sufficiently large and multiple of six, uh, then there exists an n such that at least two. n, n plus 2, and n minus 2, n minus n are prime. Okay, so this is a slight variant of this dhl 32 but rather than n, n plus 2, n plus 6, you just take n, n plus 2, and then a fixed large n minus little n. Um, so this has the following amusing consequence. Uh, again, assuming GH, you get a dichotomy. Uh, you get a disjunction. So we can't prove the Trinkham conjecture uh, using this, uh, this technology, and for similar reasons, we can't prove Goldbach's conjecture. But I can tell you in some sense that one of them is true, um, that, that, that if you have the, the, um, the generalized Elliott Hapsen conjecture, then either the Trinkham conjecture is true, or uh, uh, every multiple of six, or every, okay, every large Euclid number, is within two, some of two primes. But I can't tell you which of these is true. In fact, I mean, they should both be true. But I, 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 but I can, or you can prove, and that, that even that is conditional on this rather ambitious conjecture, is that one of them is true. Um, and the reason is just some pigeonhole principle, are just cases, all right? So, okay, uh, so this infinitely many n, for which, um, well, okay, so, so, so either this happens infinitely often, in which case, it, in, in which, in which case h1 is, is, is 2, or one of these two happens infinitely often, in which case n is within 2 of a sum of 2 primes. Um, so, um, yeah, so you can get sort of, you know, um, it's still an open problem to get an unconditional Goldbach result from this method. Um, so it's, it's, it's um, using all this machinery, it's, it's, it's tantalizingly close to being able to prove that, that every large even number is within a bounded distance of a sum of two primes. But um, strangely enough, um, uh, the, the methods are not quite uh, good enough to, to, to get that. This, is, this seems to be the, the, the best type of thing you can do. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, so th there are some senses. I mean, the, the even Goldbach conjecture and the, tr the Trinkham conjecture are considered very close to each other. But there are some there are some senses in which the Goldbach is strictly harder than the tr tr Trinkham conjecture. That uh, you know, various partial results we have on Trin primes do not translate to partial results on Goldbach necessarily. OK, so the, the main thing is to, is to prove this sort of um, conjecture, that, that you, you want to find uh, k-tuples where at least j numbers are prime. Um, so this would be very easy if the primes had positive density. Okay. If the primes had positive density, I say density bigger than alpha. OK, now, of course they don't, but let's, let's, let's suppose they do just temporarily. Um, okay, let's okay. Okay. okay, then, um, then this, this would imply the, the, the um, dixon high literal conjecture uh, whenever j is bigger than, 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 alpha, um, than alpha k. Um, and the reason it's very simple, if the primes are positive density, you, you, just, um, you just pick a number little n at random inside some big interval. You pick a big interval 1 capital n, you pick a number little n at random. If you pick a number uniformly at random, then... Um, yeah, if you pick n uniformly at random, then if the primes have positive density, then just probabilistically, um, n plus h1 should be prime with probably at least delta. Okay, and n plus h2 is prime with probably at least delta, and so forth. 
So just from the linearity of expectation, um, the, tot the total expected number of prime numbers you get inside this k-tuple should be at least k delta. And so if k delta is bigger than j, then you, you must get, um, uh, um, this must happen at least once, actually, rather than one, let's make it an n to two n. Okay, and then you just let, uh, in fact, we call it x to two x, because that's my notation very shortly. And then you let the x go to infinity, and you get infinitely many such, such tuples. Okay, so if it has a positive density, then it would be very easy to get these sort of results. Now, of course, the prime number theorem tells you to put the prime number density zero um, with respect to uniform distribution. So you can't run this argument um, directly, um, but there's no, no reason why you have to pick the uniform distribution. Right? You, if, you, you can pick n by some other distribution, and the same argument works. So that's basically what Goldstein, and Pinson, and Yudum do. So um, more formally, what they observe. Uh, is that um, to prove um, um, the dixon heidelberg root partial dixon heidelberg root conjecture, it suffices to find a, a good probability, probability distribution uh, on x to x. Actually, uh, the way we set things up, we don't actually use a, a probability distribution. We actually unnormalize it um, to find a function nu from x to Two x to the positive reals. Okay, so so it's, it, it has to be non-negative. Um, okay, so this will be our unnormalized uh, probability distribution, such that uh, um, such that we 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 have some upper bound on its total mass, as bounded by some some alpha, let's say, uh, times the normalization constant. So x is a parameter going up to infinity. Every time I write little of one, it means something that goes to zero when x goes up to infinity. Um, so alpha times some, some normalizing factor, which will depend on x. Um, but also, okay, so the total mass is small, but um, the probability that you're a prime, which in this language will be the, the same sum weighted by, uh, let's say, um, the Chebyshev function, um, theta. So theta of n is just log n when n is prime, and zero otherwise. Okay, it's basically a von Mangold function. Um, okay, if, if you have some lower bound on this, say, bounded by, say, by beta i times b, uh, and then you can come up by log x because of the log x here. So, um, so these two statements, this is true for all theta i from 1 to k. This is like saying that the probability, the probability that, that uh, n plus h i is prime is like beta, is at least beta over alpha. And so if, if the total expected number of, of primes that you get, uh, if you sample n using this, this weight function, uh, if, this, if, if this is bigger than, um, than j, then you can prove um, um, this conjecture. Um, I guess yeah, uh, b has to be non-zero. But it doesn't really matter what b is. OK, I guess alpha also needs to be non-zero too. OK. so. Um, all right, so, so basically, if you can find any weight, doesn't have, doesn't have a uniform weight, doesn't, uniform weight doesn't work, but if you, you can pick any weight for which you have a good upper bound on the total sum and a good lower bound on, on the sum weighted by one of these, these prime counting functions. Um, and if the ratio between this bound and this bound is good enough, it's bigger than some j, then you can find j, then you can find, uh, j primes in this k-tuple. So once you have the observation, um, then it, it's... Uh, then all you need to do is you need to find a, a, a good a good sieve. Okay, so so these 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 things are called sieve uh, weight functions. These news, the news have to be to be positive so that you actually get a, a probability measure. This doesn't work if if if, if um, new is negative at some places. It has to be positive everywhere. You need to be able to get upper bounds on on the raw sum and lower bounds on the weighted sum. Okay, and this ratio has to be good enough. Okay, so um, then so then the the the, tr the trick is to find is to choose a good if um, good new, okay. Um, so, okay, but but uh, okay, but this, this is a sieve theoretic question, and, and this is something that, that Solberg already understood, um, uh, you know, 30, 40 years ago. Um, okay, so um, yeah, so we, there there are many sieves that that you could try, but the most efficient sieve, as it turns out, and we tried many other sieves, but okay, the most efficient sieves are the Solberg sieves, um, and the Solberg sieves come basically. Um, in order to make this always non-negative, non um, it's, it's not necessary, but it's certainly sufficient to, to pick a square. So the, the Selberg sieve 
um, um, the, idea, the idea of the Solberg sieve is, 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 to, is, to, is to pick a, a, a function which looks something like this. Uh, so these are some sieve weights, and you sum of all these, well, um, okay, initially, the initial work of Goldson, Pinson, and Yodorum, uh, you sum of all these that, that divided the product. Okay, so um, the, the motivation for this is, is that you, 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 you want your sieve to already have a good chance of already picking out those numbers n for which n plus h1 up to n plus hk are all prime, or, or are mo mostly prime. So, um, a, you know, a good initial choice, which, which, uh, um, uh, if you pick um, mu of d log n over d to the k, so if you, if you pick the, the kth weighted um, um, the, the kth momentum function applied to this product, um, n plus h1 up to n plus hk. Um, this function, as it turns out, basically only is, uh, is only non-zero when all these guys are already prime. Um, uh, maybe there's a, uh, maybe some can be powers of primes, but 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 um, but essentially this the, this sieve um, is, is is already non-negative non and it already picks out those numbers which are prime. And um, there should be, if you assume the highly loaded prime super conjecture, um, these bounds you should get all the right bounds that you need, and you should be able to prove the, the, um, the, the whole prime triple conjecture. Now, unfortunately, for this particular choice of sieve, proving these bounds is, is, is basically exactly as hard as proving the prime triple conjecture. So uh, you, this, um, this function d doesn't work, but, uh, but, you can pick, but you can sort of take truncations of this, um, sieve weights, which, which have a better chance of working, where you don't restrict all these guys to be exactly prime, but you basically restrict them to be almost prime. So uh, Goldson, Pinson, and Yodorum tried sort of the classic Silberg sieve, which is basically something that looks like this, and then you can tweak what these weights are. Um, but then actually, um, it was observed by Maynard, and actually this is something we really should have observed many, many years ago, but um, you, you don't have to use these one-dimensional sieves. Um, actually, it turns out to be more efficient to use a multi-dimensional sieve. Okay, so, so rather than, than base the sieve entirely on, on what divides the product of these numbers uh, to determine your sieve, um, more flexibly uh, you, can, you can find sieves that, that uh, are based on the, on, the, on the individual factorizations of, the, um, of, these, of these numbers rather than the, the joint factorization. Um, and this is a more general sieve than, 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 than this one. And it turns out that, that uh, in, in retrospect, this is what we should have used all along. Th these, these are the best sieves to use. Um, now you still have to choose the, these, these weights um, so you know this, this guarantees that this sieve is positive, um, okay. And then when you when you form these sums, you get certain quadratic forms in these coefficients, and then so you, you you have this linear algebra problem of trying to to choose the um, choices of lambda, which will make uh, this quadratic form small and this quadratic form big, and um, and so after a lot of experimentation, it turns out that uh, well, there's actually a couple of choices that, that work well, um, but the precise sieve that we end up using. Is, uh, is this, so at the, uh, okay. so we wait by the Mobius function a couple of times, um, and then we pick some function of um, the normalized logarithms. Okay, and then all this has to be squared. Um, and then for, for technical reasons, it's not so important, but uh, uh, we find it convenient to localize to a single congruence class. Um, okay, so um, this congruence class, W is just gonna be a product of small primes. And, 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 and omega is something very, very small, say log, log, log x. Okay, so you, 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 you just wanna, um, you don't wanna, I mean, if you don't do this, then you have to deal with a singular series, which is not such a big, Castle, but it's just convenient to, 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 not, to not have to care about it. Um, so you, you, you pick a congruous class. Uh, B is, is a class such that uh, B plus HI is primitive. For I, you can do this precisely because your, your topple is, is admissible. Um, and, then you, uh, and then F is some complex, smooth, complex supported function. from um, a positive orthon, in fact, RK to R. 
So some cutoff um, to localizing d1 and dk to be, to be some, bounded by some small power of, of x, like say it's like square root of x or x for one tenth or something. Um, so you, you have some localizing function here, uh, which you get to pick. Uh, um, so you, you pick a function, you create the sieve, um, and then what will happen when you do that, if all goes well, you should be able to prove bounds on, on, um, uh, on, on, these, on these expressions involved where alpha and beta will depend in, in terms of, of, of this, of this um, smooth function, color function, capital F. Um, and then the remaining game is sort of this, this calculus of variations problem is, is that you have to, 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 to maximize the ratio of one integral involving F with another integral involving F. Um, so after some trial and error, this turns out to be pretty much uh, the, the optimal choice of, of, uh, of, of sieve weight. Uh, let's see. Okay, so um, how would you, um, where did my razor go? Ah, thank you. Okay, so if you choose such a sieve, how would you try to, to bound these sums that I mentioned before? So this is something that it's uh, actually it's very standard sieve theory. As it turns out, you don't have to do, well at least, uh, it, it, it depends on where F is supported. Uh, if F has, has small support, then you don't need to do very much. Um, but some of the, the more recent results, you have to do some tricks um, when your support of F is a bit bigger than, than what classical sieve theory can handle. Okay, but um, if you wanted to, to control something like this, so suppose, for example, you want to control just the raw sum, which is simpler than, than the one that primes. Um, well, if you want to control the sum, you just, you just stick this in and you expand out the square and you rearrange. And so after just a little bit of work, uh, you get a monstrous sum. Well, not, not that monstrous, okay, but okay, moderately complicated. Okay, so if you expand out everything, uh, you will eventually get uh, get this mess here. Okay, so there'll be a, a sum over divisors, moduli, and then some weight function uh, depending on, on those moduli times um, times this thing, uh, which is basically counting you are summing one over a certain arithmetic regression. Um, all the numbers n in a certain interval makes a two x, which obey a certain number of congruence conditions. Okay. Now, because you're only summing one, uh, we, know how to, we know how to sum one in ethnic progression. That's one of the things we, we actually can do. Um, so, uh, well, at least the modulus is smaller than the, than the width of the, of the, uh, uh, of the, of the interval. Um, so, so first of all, um, the complex conditions are only compatible if uh, you need d1, d1 prime, up to dk, dk prime, and w to all be co-prime. Um, and, in, and, and once they are, um, this expression is equal to just x over um, w times gcd d1 d prime up to dk dk prime plus an error, big old one from round off, okay? Now, um, now this error turns out to be okay um, as long as, as this function f doesn't have too bad of support. So uh, this error is negligible If uh, the support of f is contained in those k-tuples where the sum is strictly less than one half, okay, so as long as you're bounded in this sort of a simplex, uh, so you know the, the, you have this positive orthant here, r k plus. So as long as you are in a certain simplex of size at most one half, um, as long as that's supported, then um, then the, the total modulus here actually can't get any bigger than than, than x. Um, you need one half because there's, there's two factors, d1 and d1 prime, so the other half only comes in the square. Yeah. Um, but yeah, as long as your support isn't too big, um, this error is, is, is negligible, and then you can just have the main term, and so, you, then, then, so then, then you have this, this big sum 
of, of this main term, but um, this you can, you can, you can bound use, using multiplicative number theory. Uh, which is actually not very difficult multiplic number theory. It's actually just elementary. Um, and, you know, it, um, it, it's, it's on the same level as, as, as knowing that the zeta function has a pole at, at one. Okay. You don't need any zero free regions or, or anything fancy. You, you just need the pole, simple pole at one. Uh, so to cut a long story short, uh, if you do that, uh, what you find is that, is that uh, you, you do get an asymptotic um, where B is, is some normalizing factor, which is not very important, uh, but uh, here it is anyway. Okay, B is a normalizing factor, and alpha, what it is, is it will be at the integral of f uh, differentiated once in each direction. You take a k4 derivative in a mixed derivative and you square it. Okay, so you get this, you get this particular quadratic expression in f, and, and that is your alpha. This, is, this will be the denominator in the Colson Prince order method. Okay, and you can, you can do that as, as long as your support is, 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 is not too big. Okay, so um, so that's pretty easy. Uh, well, it's straightforward. Okay, this is like a pager calculation. Okay. Now, um, the trickier sum is one of the primes in it. Okay. So, for example, uh, you might be interested in what, in what happens when when um, when h plus h k is prime. So you also have to control th this sum. And you can expand out a very similar thing. Um, but, uh, but one simplification is that prime numbers don't have very many factors. Uh, so, so the dk actually will turn out to be just one. Uh, so you, um, it becomes a similar sum, but you only go up to k minus one. Okay, you get lots of similar things. You get lots of mu's, lots of f's, um, but, uh, but, the, but the last entry in the f is now zero. Um, and you get a similar sum, okay, which I won't write down exactly. Um, the, the, the conditions, but you get a similar sum on, on an arithmetic progression, but rather than sum one, which we can do very easily, we have to, we have to sum the, the prime counting function, theta. Um, and so this, um, you know, again, this will be bounded by some main term, um, and the main term in this case, if you work it out, actually turns out to be something like this. Okay, plus an error. But, um, but now the error is it's not just bigger of one, it's a more complicated error. And if you want to control the error, um, yeah, you, you need one of, one of these uh, distribution estimates. So, so this is controlled by bombier Vinogradov or one of the earlier Halberstam con conjectures, or maybe there's Murahashi Pins Shang. Okay. okay. And um, it turns out that, um, that, that uh, these guys, one of these guys will work if your function f has a, has a support in a certain range. And the more powerful your distribution hypothesis, the larger the range of, of um, the larger your range that your function f can be supported in. So there, there are certain conditions, and maybe for lack of time, I won't know exactly what conditions uh, will come up. But, uh, but if your f is supported in a small enough range, and depending on <coughs> what level of distribution you're willing to accept, you can um, do all this error, and then you have a main term. And then um, after some more multiplicative number theory, you find that this is equal to beta times b log x. And beta is a similar thing to, to this guy. It's just that now you, you, you uh, this is a k-dimensional integral. Now you only integrate k minus 1 variables. And you only differentiate in k minus 1 variables. And the final entry is 0, and you square that. And so that you have a different quadratic form. Uh, of your function f, uh, and that's beta k. There's similar formulas for beta 1 and beta, up to beta k minus 1. You just permute the indices. Um, and so um, you get these, these numbers. And so as long as your function f has certain support conditions, which I've, I've not written down, um, you, can, you, can, you can write these down explicitly. And then so you, you, you have this calculus of variations problem now. You, you, have to, you have to sum all these betas and divide by, by alpha. And you have to choose a good cutoff to make, to make this, uh, this ratio as big as possible. Um, so for example, it, it turns out that if you choose a, a good choice of f, um, you, can make this, you can make this ratio grow like, like log of k. 
you can make it call that log of k. Um, basically, f has to be a tensor product of, of one dimensional functions and then cut off to a simplex. Um, but uh, if you, 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 you pick f's um, to, 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 to optimize this, and um, it turns out that this can grow like log k, which is why um, for k large enough, um, you can get about log k primes in, um, in, in admissible k tuples, which is, which is where you, 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 you get bounds, which are sort of exponential. Um, in M, that, that's, that's where these sort of bounds come from. Um, and for small k, um, you can use computers to actually you just, you just plug in like an explicit polynomial for f, and you just numerically find what alpha and beta are. And so for small, for small alphas, uh, this is how we, we get the explicit uh, bounds on, 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 on gaps for small k. Um, OK, so in the last uh, zero minutes, um, I would just say that, um, OK, so there are these support conditions uh, which are a bit restrictive. So if, if you want to maximize this ratio, you want to make the Fs as, 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 as um, range over as large a class as possible. And um, so we, a, lot of the program, um, a lot of our polymath project was, was of, we were sort of obsessed with finding larger and larger support ranges for which you could actually run this argument. Um, so there's a couple extra tricks that you, that you can use here. Um, so, so one thing you notice is, is that the, um, the, sum, um, the sum with the primes is much harder to estimate than the sum without the primes. So this is imbalance of difficulty. So you can, you can try to, to exploit that by, by sort of transferring some of the difficulty um, of, 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 of this expression over to this expression. So um, rather than, so, so here we, we, we expand out over a, a k-fold sum here, and then we're summing one, which is a very easy sum here and then a, a messy thing here. But actually, you, could, you, can, you can play a slightly different game. Like, you could, you could just sum up to k minus 1, and you, you put some sort of divisor sum in here. Yeah, there, there, there's, there's some Mobius functions and whatever. You, you can move some of, some, some of these terms over here. Um, you, you have to split up the f's in, in, into pieces in order to do that. But, but you, you can rearrange the sum a little bit so that rather than summing one, which is sort of too easy to sum, you, you sum something a bit more difficult. Like you sum a divisor function here um, at the cost of, of uh, yeah, and then you get to remove one variable over here. Um, and, and then that expression begins to look a lot, a lot, a lot more like um, the, the, the type of expression that you, you had to control um, for the, the, the other sum. And so um, it turns out that, that if, you, if, 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 you shift, if you shift things over, you can, you, um, um, you can relax the support condition um, you, um, a, a little bit. Um, basically, rather than making this guy bound by one half, you can, you can, you can make uh, um, yeah, um, this guy. And you, you only need uh, the sum of k minus one of these guys, rather than k of these guys to be bound by one half, plus all permutations. Uh, so you get an enlarged region here. Uh, that's one of the tricks we used. Um, Another trick we use is that, uh, uh, well, OK. Um, for, for, for this sum, we, we don't need an asymptotic. That's, that's too strong for what we need. We, we just need a lower bound. Okay. Okay. We just need a lower bound on, on, the, on, the, on the prime density in order to, to, to prove our theorem. So if you just want a lower bound here, you don't need to, to estimate every single term in this big, messy expression. Um, uh, with a, with a good error, error bound. Um, you just need a lower bound. And so what we found was that we found that, this, that, that um, uh, this elementary inequality uh, is, is very useful. Um, so you know, so you, you, we have a square here. And, so, um, and the, um, the enemy is actually those d's which, which, are, which are very big, near, near, uh, near the edge of the support of f. And, and, uh, and, and those terms, those, those give you the worst error terms that are hardest to control. So you can split this big thing into, into two expressions, one coming from all the d's, which are a, a little bit smaller, and then, and then the boundary terms, ones that are close to the boundary. So you split into, into two terms, a plus b. Um, and the worst terms are the cross terms b times b. And, and they, they give you moduli that are just too big for your, whatever your earlier hypersam conjecture is to obey. But um, b squared is positive, so you just drop it, and you just, you just use a lower bound like this. Um, and maybe like consistency, use capitals. And these expressions, um, their, their, their moduli are still low enough that, that, uh, that, that you can still use your distribution hypotheses. Um, you can still get a useful lower bound. And it's not quite as good as beta k, but just you, 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 um, you, you have to give up a little bit in, in, in your lower bound. But you still get, you still get a non-trivial lower bound for these expressions. Um, 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 
even when your function f pokes outside of the support that, that you, you, uh, you, you previously had. So it turns out that this is trade-off between enlarging the support of f and, and shrinking this lower bound. And the trade-off turns out to be slightly advantageous. And so um, using those tricks, this is how we could get uh, k all the way down to 3 in particular and to get an optimal. Um, Bound of three two. Um, now, I, okay, I wanted to, to talk about the parity problem and why you can't beat that, but I think that will have to wait until the next lecture. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Any questions or comments? Good. So all these instruments that if you really look at the prime number from additive perspective, right? Yes. Okay, you can do anything more than obvious, like obvious kind of constraints. Yes. Are they bound from another side? It's something you cannot do. So you have some, some sort of equation you cannot solve in prime and you need no simple reason for that. Um, not, not over the images, I don't know of any examples. Um, over function fields, uh, I think there are some, some examples like this. Um, there, there are some polynomials which can't be prime, uh, even though there's no obvious uh, uh, obstruction for them being prime. I think Conrad and Conrad and some other people have, yeah. have uh, some examples. Maybe Aral moves, Aral? Aral. Sorry? Aral moves, Aral. Yes? <laughs> um, I mean, didn't you do some Mobius functions or function fields where there are obstructions which are not congruent side? Yes, that's, that's true. OK. Can you give an example? <laughs> not off the top of my head, but there are some there are some polynomials over function fields for which Mobius is essentially constant without the polynomial us, being one. Yeah. Can you tell us a reference where people... Yes, that's, uh, that was pointed out by the Conrads, by, by Brian and Keith Conrad, or at, at least by one of them, but I think by both. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah, so over, over function fields there's a lot more structure, and so there's, there's a lot more going on somehow. But uh, yeah, but, but o o over the integers, there's somehow this, this, there, there should be no extra structure in the primes beyond to the local obstructions. That, that's the common belief. Um, yeah. no, but this can believe on the base of ignorance. Yeah? Believe because you don't know that. Right? Well, no we have not known it for a very long time, so it, the, the, the evidence has accumulated. Yeah, I mean, but everything that we can prove is consistent with, with, with randomness. I mean, um, but yeah, we, we can't prove randomness directly. I mean, the primes are not actually random, so. But, <laughs> Thank you again. Mm -hmm.